Welcome to the Writing Western Podcast. I'm your host, Brendan Rensink. Today we speak with Dr. Robert Lee about land grab universities, a multi-year project he recently published with High Country News. Let me take a quick moment to explain a bit about the podcast and who produces it. Writing Westward is a production of the Charles Red Center for Western Studies at Brigham Young University. For better or worse, it's a one-man operation with me, Brennan Rensink, playing role of host, producer, sound engineer, and everything else. I'm associate director of the Red Center and an associate professor of history at BYU, neither of which roles trained me for the current task. But I do have a lot of fun doing this because I'm passionate about better understanding the North American West, the region I have called home for most of my life. In each Writing Westward episode, I have a conversation with writers of the region, academics, journalists, novelists, poets, scientists, anyone authoring anything about the West. My goal is that these conversations will spark listeners' curiosity to dig in a bit more themselves and think differently about the peoples, histories, environments, ideas, and identities that make up the North American West, or that we ascribe to the region. Please leave reviews or comments on whatever platform you are listening and let me know if we're succeeding. For updates or communication, please follow Writing Westward on Facebook at Writing Westward Podcast or on Twitter at Writing West. You can find all episodes on our website, writingwestward.org, or listen and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube, or most all major podcast distribution platforms, apps, and services. To learn more about the BYU Red Center, Stay tuned, and at the end of the episode, I'll offer some additional information about our projects, programming, live-streamed lectures, funding opportunities for research, and events. Find the center at redcenter.byu.edu. That's R-E-D-D Center. For more regular updates, you can also find us on Facebook and Twitter at BYU Red Center. Now, let me tell you a little bit about today's guest. Dr. Robert Lee is a university lecturer in American history at the University of Cambridge. He earned his PhD in history from UC Berkeley and has a long list of awards and honors to his name. Recently, at the end of March 2020, he and journalist Tristan Atone published an article with High Country News entitled Land Grab Universities. They simultaneously released a companion website, landgrabu.org, that provides data visualizations to accompany the article. This multi-year project examines the indigenous lands that were used to fund the establishment of land-grant universities across the nation, starting with the 1862 Morrill Act. In the American West, many universities continue to generate revenue from these lands. This work pairs with the growing movement in higher education to study how institutions have benefited from slavery in their early years, but it is perhaps more universal in scope and relevance. This work reveals how the sale of native lands, especially in the American West, were central to the founding of state universities. It reminds us that the lands used to endow public universities were not simply a donation from the federal government to the states, but in fact millions of acres of recently and often violently expropriated indigenous lands. The Pulitzer Center and Fund for Investigative Journalism provided support for this work. I hope that High Country News' example of collaborative and in-depth journalism and scholarship will encourage other news organizations and academic researchers to work together more in the future. They have done us a great service with this project. Dr. Robert Lee, welcome to Writing Westward. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Brendan. A couple of months ago, we had a episode about the Civil War. We did Megan Kate Nelson's book on the Civil War in the Southwest, and I'm happy to kind of return to that era, at least in the beginning of what we're going to talk about. During the early years of the Civil War in 1862, Congress passed a number of pieces of legislation that uh, had a huge impact on the West. And the Homestead Act and the Pacific Railways Act, Railroad Act are the ones we usually talk about the most as examples of projecting northern interests of free land, free labor, industry, expansion out West and across the continent. But less discussed uh, is a third piece of legislation, the Morrill Act, or the Land Grant Agricultural and Mechanical College Act of 1862. And that's where we're going to start today. Can you share with us how the history of the Morrill Act, uh, what it is and how the history of it has traditionally been told and celebrated in the United States, and especially in Western land-grant universities? 
Yeah, the history of the um, the Morrill Act, as you mentioned, it's typically lumped together with the other two uh, sort of uh, to make the big three of 1862, right? The Pacific Railway Act, the Homestead Act, the Morrill Act. Um, in terms of the amount of land that was distributed by those acts, the, the Morrill Act is actually the, the smallest of the three. Um, it dealt with about 11 million acres, whereas the Homestead Act was several hundred million acres, ultimately, uh, and the Pacific Railway Act was uh, between the two. Uh, but the Morrill Act, it's passed, it's, it's a third of these three acts. It's passed in 1862 over a period of several months. First comes the Homestead Act and then the Pacific Railway Act on uh, July 1st, 1862. Then July 2nd, 1862, uh, the Morrill Act or what comes to be known as the Morrill Act or the Agricultural College Act as it was called at the time. Um, and what the Morrill Act does is it, uh, it provides endowment land to states to distribute, uh, to, to sell, to raise funds for state universities. Um, and it's part of a, uh, a sort of, it, it didn't come out of nowhere. Uh, there had been agricultural and mechanical colleges, uh, in the United States. There had been, uh, federal funding for universities before. But what you had in the Morrill Act was the first a uh, national program designed to fund universities uh, using land from the public domain, which meant land that had been uh, expropriated from Native Americans, um, to fund uh, to to fund universities on a national on a national level. And what was the specific mission of these universities to be? Well, a lot of them didn't, a lot of them didn't exist yet. Um, but the mission that was given through the Morrill Act was, uh, to fund, uh, agricultural and mechanical colleges. So to put them on the leading edge of agricultural, uh, agricultural science and sort of practical science. The idea was to expand higher education, uh, to the, uh, industry, the emerging industrial classes and the sons and daughters of, uh, of farmhands, uh, across, uh, across America, uh, which is why the, the sort of broad literature on the Morrill Act, uh, tends to ask questions about uh, whether or not it fulfilled its mm -hmm. democratic promise uh, to bring education to a larger uh, segment of uh, U.S. society. And many listeners maybe have heard the phrase land-grant colleges. So here, you know, I'm in the state of Utah, so we have the University of Utah, and then there's Utah State University. And it's often that state university that was the land-grant college. So Utah State, New Mexico State University, Colorado State University – um, there's often kind of the two, the flagship and then the land grant college. And that's often then where we have a lot of the, those states agricultural um, departments, um, or often have their longest roots in those land grant colleges. I got my doctorate from the University of Nebraska, which is a land grant college. And the Moral Act was uh, really celebrated there. And we talked a lot about the democratization of education and some of the successes there. But um, the work that you did with High Country News takes this story and upends it and shows some of the darker history lurking beneath. I wanted to, uh, to read a quick quote here from the piece. And this should ring somewhat uh, familiar. Uh, when we think about the – say those other two acts, the Homestead Act or the Pacific Railways Act, the often violent dispossession of Native peoples are – clear parts of those histories often. Um, it's widely acknowledged that the lands that were being uh, deeded out to homesteaders a few years before had been taken either by violence or uh, by treaty, often you know, fraudulently or by coercion or other means. Um, and the same goes for the Railways Act. But the world of higher ed in the United States has very much kind of sidestepped that dark history. So let, let me read this quick quote. You write, over the past two years, High Country News has located more than 99% of all Moral Act acres, identified their original indigenous inhabitants and caretakers, and researched the principle raised from their sale in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. We reconstructed approximately 10.7 million acres 
taken from nearly 250 tribes, bands, communities throughout over 160 violence-backed land sessions, a legal term for the giving up of territory. So there, there's a deep violent history behind land-grant colleges, which is why you name this piece Land Grab Universities. Why do you think that this connection or this the violent dispossession of Native peoples has been obscured from the story of land grant universities in the United States. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. The how the how the historiography on the on the Morrill Act, the discussions by historians of land grant universities, um, somehow got decoupled from the uh, what is today the well known at least among historians, I would say, uh, history of indigenous dispossession by the United States. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's hard to explain. It's sort of like the subfield that time forgot, right? Mm. Uh, you read in the, you read in the historiography and the moral act, um, and there's discussions about sort of how well they lived up to their missions, the processes through which, uh, Women, African Americans were able to, uh, were able to come to land grant universities, the regional differences among land grant universities. I mean, so some of it, one of what explains it, um, I think, uh, historiographically at least, is that, uh, there had been some, some well rutted, uh, questions that you asked about land grant universities and, the question of where the land actually came from was never one of them. Hmm. So there had been a sort of long ongoing discussions in the literature on, on land grant universities uh, that um, is robust, but uninterested in the, in the issue of the, the sources of the land um, that provided the financial, uh, the financial underpinnings. Of, of these universities. Um, at the same time, there's a sort of counter narrative, uh, that you referenced earlier, maybe even, uh, understating the, uh, the extent to which the Morrill Act is, uh, is celebrated, um, by, by universities as part of sort of the, the, the lore around their founding. Um, at Purdue University, there is a, uh, the sort of magnificent Art Deco style panoramic mural over the uh over the the social science library that sort of students walk under uh to come into to come into the library there's public art um at Iowa State at at Penn State um there are statues of of Lincoln there are moral uh moral halls at at least a dozen at least a dozen universities there was um, in Nebraska there was a moral hall it was the i think it was their the, natural, the natural history, history museum. museum right yeah yeah. Uh, so there's a, at, on the one hand, there are, are, are a set of questions that historians had become accustomed to asking about land grant universities that didn't involve, uh, uh, dispossession at all. Then there was the sort of counter narrative of, uh, of celebrating the, the origin specifically of the, of land grant universities, uh, and the Morrill Act. And somewhere along the way, um, the the emerging story that we get out of the the new Indian history of thinking about the sort of consequences the 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 traumatic and dramatic consequences of, of dispossession uh, hadn't caught up yet to the literature on the Morrill Act but it it had been in the in the past few years um, building on the work coming out of uh, coming out of universities reexamining their uh, their ties to the transatlantic slave yeah. trade. Um, have prompted a number of folks to start asking questions about, uh, the, the sources of, of wealth at universities more, more broadly. Um, so what you've seen in the past five or six years, um, is this question, uh, about the relationship between indigenous dispossession and the growth and development of land grant universities sort of emerging, uh, into the literature, uh, Primarily along, uh, theoretical lines, sort of, uh, situating the problem as a problem. Uh, but what hadn't been, what hadn't been done, uh, what hadn't been added to this emerging literature, uh, is an effort to empirically understand, uh, 
uh, the connections between universities and the indigenous nations uh, whose land became part of their endowments. Empirically and geographically, I mean, your your article includes um, a companion site with some great visualizations where you can go through and click on individual universities and then see where the land uh, sales uh, were at that helped fund their endowments and so forth. But having that data, I think, is really powerful, being able to see it and to see those connections across the continent to places so far flung from where the actual university may be, I think, is really powerful and helps to not necessarily undercut, but to really problematize our understanding of universities' foundings. A lot of higher education history or histories of higher education are often written as institutional histories, written by the institution. and not always interested in asking some of these more challenging questions. Yeah, um, I mean, another another vector in the um, the explanation for why this uh, this issue has been overlooked, I think, has to do with um, the sort of overwhelming complexity of the problem. I mean, what we're talking about is that the Moral Act itself, is, as a law, it's a, it's a few pages long, but its implications uh, reach out to more than 50 universities. Um, there are 47 states involved, uh, each of which is uh, administering this uh, this act on their own, uh, sort of creating all the sort of wrinkles in the in the way that the um, act actually operates in the in the in the real world mm-hmm. um it connects back to 11 million acres or so which is broken up into nearly 80,000 parcels um that's a lot of land records to comb through yeah in order to reconnect each of those parcels to the to the universities it's a, it's a problem of sort of overwhelming uh overwhelming complexity um but without doing that you're left with just the the abstract um, recognition that universities benefited from the sell-off of uh, the sort of the, the profits from dispossession, um, and you can't you can't move you can't move the story any further than that without breaking down the connections between the lands and the universities themselves. You see, you you help bring some clarity there, and you know lift the veil on what's other, otherwise very obscure, and as you say, it's just abstract and it's hard to really to really understand. So how does this process then work? How did, say, uh, Cornell, which you say was one of the the biggest benefactors, how do they then go about uh, selecting which lands that they are going to claim, be it within their own state territory, or often they're claiming lands across the continent, uh, and then selling? I mean, the one example that really struck me, I'm from the Pacific Northwest, so when you wrote that um, it was Duwamish lands in the Puget Sound, um, that were sold to benefit Clemson in South Carolina. Uh, that was kind of the example that really jumped out at me. So how does this process then work? How does Clemson select Duwamish lands in the Pacific Northwest and then sell them to benefit their endowment? Yeah, so there's there's one big division in how the grant is administered, uh, and it has to do with geography and the status of uh, land from the public domain that had already been privatized. So how it worked was Eastern universities, Southern universities like Clemson, uh, Corn- um, you know, uh, universities in the Northeast like Cornell, several universities in the Midwest, um, Ohio State and others, they all received a script which uh, is sort of like a coupon or a voucher. Oh, because there's no more public lands available in their own state. Yeah, the lands have been long privatized. By the by, the time the Civil War comes about, these land, the, the 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 choice lands within their state boundaries have been long privatized. Um, so they get sort of these credits or coupons uh, that enable the selection of lands. Uh, in 160 acre increments, sort of the home, the typical homestead uh, size, um, anywhere on the surveyed public domain of the of the United States. Um, 
So that's how you get universities like uh, Clemson getting Duwamish land uh, or the, or Brown and then the University of Rhode Island benefiting from uh, uh, Kansas land in, mm-hmm. in Kansas. So these script, they're like uh, they're like these coupons and you can select anywhere on the public domain and those will go to the state. And there are differences in how this winds up uh, playing out. Sometimes the state will give those coupons to the university. Um, sometimes they will sell them themselves. The way that the act worked um, was that the universities were intended to live off of the interest from the endowments that were created. The, the, the endowments that were raised, the principal, uh, was never to be touched. Uh, with the exception of using a certain set amount at the beginning for uh, for building up or buying campus land, which very few actually did. Um, so there was an incentive to sell off this script uh, as fast as possible. So so you could raise the funds that could then generate the interest that could be applied to operations. Um, so very few universities engaged in sort of long term uh, speculation or very few states who were generally the administers of the grant engaged in long term speculation with the script. Typically what they did um, is that they sold it uh, in bulk to speculators um, rather quickly. So there was a buffer created between the universities and the ultimate selection of the land. With in, in most cases, the universities themselves, um, they did not select the land at all. They were just beneficiaries of uh, of the difference between what it cost the United States to conquer these lands and what they would uh, and what they would fetch on the open market. Um, they would get the, uh, the the speculators would pay the state for the script. Uh, the state would put this money into a fund. It would start paying out interest to the universities. Um, there are some, uh, there are some sort of, uh, variations in that. For, for instance, Cornell sold most of its script to Ezra Cornell, the founder of Cornell, who then, uh, engaged in the speculation and folded the profits, um, back into the university, um, which helped them. And I mean, there were two reasons why Cornell, um, was able to profit enormously over the Morrill Act, um, significantly more than any other university. Um, one, because the way that the script was distributed, um, it was roughly pegged to population. Uh, specifically, it was pegged to congressional delegation size. Uh, which is a proxy for population. And in 1860, based on the 1860 census, and in 1860, New York is the most populous state. Um, so New York winds up getting the largest land grant. They get close to a million acres. The, the, the lower end of these grants is about 90,000 acres. Um, so on the one hand, uh, New York gets the largest amount of land. Um, it's also able to, uh, flip it, uh, more profitably than almost every, almost any other university, uh, which results in a, um, an incredible boost to their endowment over a very compressed time span. Cornell is founded uh, in around 1865. By the mid 1880s, um, they are the third wealthiest university in the United wow. States. Um, they, their endowments are larger than Yale's, larger than Princeton's, only Columbia and Harvard in the in the mid 1880s um had had uh had more investable assets uh than cornell uh, and it was through this speculation that they were able to climb so quickly at the time there were maybe about 800 colleges uh in the in the united states uh, and they went from founding to third wealthiest in in about the uh the time it takes for uh, you know a, a child to reach college age so how is this different for the Western states who have their own public lands uh, to distribute? Yeah, so the, these these Eastern states, Southern, Midwestern, they get the script. Um, but the Western states, where there is still uh, significant um, public land holdings that have been typically quite recently expropriated from indigenous nations uh, within those state boundaries, um, they have to choose their land from within their state boundaries uh, and they get grandfathered into the program uh, when they uh, when they become a state. So territories 
do not get uh, are not beneficiaries uh, of the of the of the Morrill Act of 1862. You have to wait until statehood to sort of become uh, to become eligible. Um, at which point um, there you would get a, a a portion of land assigned. And what the Western states would do then um, is they would have to go out and select the land themselves. You know, one of one of the elements of the Morrill Act sort of uh, buried in its ad- administrative elements is that um, the states had to bear the cost of administering uh, administering the act, so of selling the land uh, and of managing any uh, any uh, funds or continued holdings that they had. Um, so the states would hire land agents to go and canvas the public domain and search for what they believe to be the most profitable uh, potential parcels. Um, and then they would send the, they would, they would mark these up on lists. They would send those lists to Washington. They would be approved. Um, and then the state would get the land to, uh, to, to sell off. Or as we found, one of the, one of the more surprising findings from the, from the study was the, uh, the amount of land that had yet to be sold was still retained by, by Western states. Um, and was still undergoing, uh, uh, being, uh, being leased out, uh, for typically much larger profits per acre, uh, than, than would, than the land was sold for, you know, a century ago, as you can, as you can imagine. Let me read, uh, another quote here from your High Country News piece. You write, Our data shows how the Morrill Act turned indigenous land into college endowments. It reveals two open secrets. First, according to the Morrill Act, All money made from land sales must be used in perpetuity, meaning those funds still remain on university ledgers today. So those are part of that, the principle of some of their endowments, which you've already kind of mentioned. And secondly, uh, uh, which you've already mentioned as well, you're right. And secondly, at least 12 states are still in possession of unsold moral acres as well as associated mineral rights, which continue to produce revenue for their designated institutions. So uh, the first of these points, which really does relate to what we mentioned a a little while back about this ongoing uh, movement of universities studying slavery and studying the financial benefits that various campuses have had from the history of slavery, the fact that universities were not just built on indigenous land, which we often hear sometimes in land acknowledgments when at events or things at universities, people often do acknowledge now we're meeting on the lands formerly uh, controlled by various peoples or still inhabited by ver- certain peoples. That's been widely acknowledged, but less so the fact that uh, the university endowments and the funding of ongoing operations are built and continue to be run by monies from indigenous land. You know that there are a few places that are starting to look into this, but has this been a surprise to university administrators that you've spoken with? How has this gone over? Are they aware of this at all? It has It has been a surprise to some. I mean, the... It, it really depends on whether we're talking about the universities that uh, received scrip in the 19th century versus uh, universities that received land and are still holding holding on to it today. Um, the scrip schools in general, the the funds that were were generated, uh, this was seed money. You know, the University of Nebraska, where where you went, Brendan, when when it starts out, you know, its early classes, you know, have have. 20 people in them, you know, 30 people. These are, these are tiny institutions and the, and the, the money provided through the Morrill Act is sort of like seed funding that enables them to grow into these, um, mega universities. So over time, the income that is produced from the initial funds, although it stays on the books, it becomes, uh, increasingly insignificant as a budget item. You know, uh, 10,000 for your operations in 1890 goes a lot further than 10,000 for your operations in 2020. Um, so what you see is, I mean, these are on the, these are on the books, but you can't find this in the published, uh, the published financial statements, you know, the, the annual report of the, of the state of any of these, of these universities because the budget line is so small, um, that would contain it. 
Uh, it's slightly different in the case of universities that are benefiting from the ongoing leasing of land. Um, I think in the case of New Mexico, which holds the largest amount of its original grant, um, close to 200,000 surface acres of an original 250,000 acres. So they've um, retained almost left- all of it. Yeah, the, wow. yeah, the vast majority. I think that's like uh, close to eighty percent um, that they that they have there. Uh, and last year, it produced uh, one point six million dollars, which is a more significant uh, a, a more significant sort of budget uh, budget line for these universities. But I would I would think that it's not a uh, it's not a huge amount of the entire budget. Um, but it can be significant for universities that have. Uh, in terms of in terms of programming, right? I mean, it's slightly less the the income in South Dakota State where there has been a, a move to uh, redirect or rethink how these funds are being spent by by the university. Um, their annual income is uh, is several hundred thousand uh, a year, which they have steered into programs for indigenous students. Um, and for those populations at the at the in the student body, um, that amount of funds can go uh, can be significant, right? In a way that a couple of thousand, which is what uh, the income from some of these script schools might be today, um, really won't go very far, even in terms of you know providing uh, research funding or yeah. scholarship funding for even a single student. So, what are the other states that are still holding large amounts? I think I remember from the article Idaho, Montana. Washington. Yeah, they're they're all in the West. That's right. Idaho, uh, Washington, uh, Arizona, I believe. They're all they're all in the West. What are these lands today? You you noted that they get they retain the revenues from uh, mineral rights. So are they leasing these out for mining or for timber? What how are these lands being used? Uh, yeah, I mean they're being they're 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 it's timber leasing. Uh, there's various types of uh, mineral leasing for for oil and gas. There's surface. So there's there's two types of there's two types of land, um, or at least within the sort of uh, of land that can be uh, leveraged for profit. There are surface acres and there are mineral acres, and those can be decoupled from one another. You can sell the surface acres and retain the mineral rights. Um, and continue to lease out uh, the mineral rights and, and vice versa. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, it's through mineral leasing. Uh, it's through the, the leasing of, of surface land for a whole variety, a whole variety of uses. Um, but this was one of sort of the more uh, surprising fun findings of the investigation. And it came rather late, uh, rather sort of late in the game. Um, so while we mapped out all of the lands that were originally selected, um, something that remains to be done is distinguishing, uh, the lands that remain, uh, from the lands that were, that were, that were sold, um, by universities that's, that are still benefiting from, uh, from surface and mineral acres. Um, the, we didn't get uh, that far in our investigation to figure out, um, exactly where uh, these retained acres are within the larger footprint of a, of a state's original endowment lands. So if I'm out hiking on public lands, um, I'm not going to see a sign saying, you know, you're now entering uh, lands owned by the by New Mexico State University. Um, or would they even be open to the public or are they just blended into other, you know, BLM for service lands? I think I mean I, I I don't know comprehensively, but I think at least in Idaho they are there is some parkland uh that is open to the that is open to the public that is that is part of these lands. Um but yeah, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be marked. And it goes sort of deeper than that. Even even the sort of all the all of the Moral Act lands that have been sold, a lot of them um are yeah are now in places that that people might know they're in you know the Mark Twain National Forest in in Missouri they're in downtown LA they're around Lake Tahoe um there are places where folks have probably been to I uh years ago when I lived in California um I went to Lake Tahoe and like a lot of other tourists there um I stopped at a place called Vikings Home which is a uh a national historic landmark, a, a home built in the late 19th century uh, in a Nordic style, 
right hmm. on Emerald Bay. Um, so if you drive around Lake Tahoe, a lot of people will stop and take pictures at Emerald Bay. They'll visit Viking Home and they'll, uh, you know, they'll visit a, a, a landmark. Uh, it's just not a landmark for its, uh, its role in being sold for part of, uh, for part of a, um, endowment, endowment lands that raised money for a university. Yeah. In the article, you do include a few pictures of some locations. One, the building in West Hollywood where the Directors Guild of America is, you have, uh, you even list the exact parcel ID of, uh, you know, attached to the land sale or an intersection in rural Nebraska, a private residence in Merced, California, um, a scrapyard in El Rosa, Minnesota. So is this a future stage of, um, the project is further identifying? So here you have all these parcel IDs of ones that have been sold, but I'm trying to identify them, the ones that are still, still owned by universities as well. Yeah, that's a, that's another stage in it. I mean, all the all the photographs in the piece were the work of uh, Kaylin Goodluck, uh, the photographer at, uh, at High Country News, who went on a tour of several states to try and uh, he went out with his GPS. I mean, you can do this too with the um, with the with the data that we've made available online. You can download it. You can uh, pull it up on your phone. You could walk onto these parcels. Uh, they are, for the most part, um, accurate to the acre. Uh, so Kalen went out and he visited a number of these parcels to try and get a, get a ground's eye view of what's going on. I mean, one of the real challenges from this uh, story from a uh, – from a rhetorical perspective or a storytelling perspective um, is how do you make uh, this, this sort of this, this incredibly large um, abstraction real? I mean, our investigation was looking at the problem of uh, connecting indigenous nations lands to universities from a bird's eye view. We we're zoomed out. Um, and trying to get a sort of a glimpse of a glimpse of the whole. Um, and what that leaves out um, in terms of storytelling is sort of the uh, the the more uh, the more human uh, side of this story. Um, but what Kalen provided was a um, a way to to ground this story where uh, where the land itself could become uh, the main character um, in the story that we were telling. Yeah, and through these pictures you can see it. I think it also reflects a broader trend in the violent realities of settler colonialism. We have historical markers for you know, where there have been massacres, where there have been large-scale battles, and we do have markers and places on the land that we directly associate with violence and with native dispossession. But inherent in the settler colonial project of native dispossession and settle, settlement of non-native peoples and the building up of states and territories. I think there's so much more uh, violence embedded in that, but it's it's subtle and it's hard to always see. And scrolling through these pictures that um, Kalen took, if you were to take the captions off and present this as a as an art exhibit, there's nothing in these pictures that thematically would point anyone to the topic of native dispossession. It just looks like a slice of everyday America, right? These are just regular scenes uh, from next door, uh, you know, an intersection across the street, a shopping mall, a playground. Um, but it speaks to the fact that underneath um, everything in the United States, um, the most suburban of, you know, landscapes you can find underneath it, there is a story of native dispossession and often of violence. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I've been teaching uh, a course on land and power here in Cambridge uh, this term. And one of the things that we read recently was William Cronin's classic essay, uh, The Trouble with Wilderness, um, where he's arguing that part of the part of the trouble with wilderness is that it's something that we uh we see as as beyond where we where we live, right? Um, it's not in your backyard. It's in the mountains that you that you drive to. I think there's something analogous going on here, where there's this sort of the, the trouble with dispossession uh, is that it's 
cloistered at you know certain sites you know the 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 sand creek uh massacre national monument uh custer's battlefield right custer's last stand uh there's these places where we're invited to think about it um when in reality uh, it's it's all around us. I mean, one of the things that didn't make it into the into the story here um, is a lot of research that went into trying to understand the sort of we, the the banality of the of the footprint of the of the moral act in our sort of everyday lives. So one of the things that we found was that um, if you uh, spatially cross-reference the parcels, the Moral Act parcels, uh, against the locations of Starbucks in the United States. Um, you find that more than, there's more than a hundred Starbucks sort of cast across the United States on these parcels. You know, there's your, your neighborhood target. Your barber shop is there. Your, your house, your, your backyard, a golf course might be there. Um, uh, you know, the highway that you ride on to get to work cuts across one of these one of these parcels um it's just all around us which is what makes i i think often uh integrating the history of indigenous dispossession into the sort of uh uh standard narratives of u.s history difficult right because it's it's always there um and it's uh it's all it's all around us it reminds me of a digital project that came up a few years ago it was called Native Lands. I'm trying to remember the the exact URL of the website, but you. This could... is uh, NativeLands.ca. .ca. It's a, it's a, okay. It's, yeah, it's a project based in Canada. Yeah, um, and you could click in uh, a, your GPS coordinates, and it would tell you, you know, you're on the traditional homelands of of these various peoples. And it, um, it looks like I just pulled it up. It looks like they've actually done. This may be a different website. Uh, I, the, the website has sort of changed over over the yeah, years. Yeah, it looks very um, different. But you can you can do this as well. Um, you can do this as well on the on the landgrabu.org website. On the maps, there's a there's a box where you can sort of click in. Yeah. Uh, this is a standard tool now uh, on a lot of uh, digital mapping platforms. You know, if you enable uh, location identification, uh, you can you can identify your uh, where you are pretty easily. Um, so you can either do your set, you know, where your computer is. Or you can plug yeah. in an address. What I was going to say is the the native lands one um, was more a little bit more in the abstract. It the early version that I had last seen, and yeah, the website they've updated a bunch. I believe it did show you that it was some pretty huge polygons, but it did reference it to certain treaties, um, mm -hmm. which gave you a little bit of direct connection. Okay, so my hometown is on treaty lands, you know, from 1862 or whenever. Uh, but your project takes that even more more granular and gives another uh, documentary uh, connection to it wasn't just by a land treaty but oh my word like this plot of land with the starbucks is you know as you say uh was from uh was also then attached to land sold to benefit a university but it again it just helps inform this narrative uh or to try to weave into our understanding of uh, america as it is today that it's it's all built on not just on native land, but native land that was often violently taken. I mean, I'm 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 glad you bring up the native land uh, .ca site. I mean, something that uh, you know, speaking of things that we didn't get to do, but we would we would have liked to have done, and we'd like to see uh, others who who build on this research um, to do more of is to think about um, what what that website does uh, really well um, is think about the. Uh, the multiple uh, geographies of indigenous North America. I mean, we relied on on treaty boundaries for the for the most part. Um, uh -huh. Treaties, unratified treaties, known areas of of land seizure. Um, but what unifies them is the claim uh, by the United States that this is how the United States. Uh, legally took possession of the lands, um, and those don't always match uh, one to one. Onto the stories of indigenous nations about uh, about where territories were. So what you see in the native land uh, CA site um, is an effort to deal with those multiple geographies, um, those contested geographies, um, 
So if you used different, uh, you know, with a different set of assumptions um, about uh, about the boundaries of territories laid over onto the data that we found um, would reveal additional stories about um, the sort of layered history of possession of places in North America. That's the problem with many maps is they freeze, you know, native geography at a certain place in time. And then we often then read backwards in time, right? Th- that you know, this was that this group's territory and it always was, but it was often evolving and dynamic or overlapping or contested. And uh, there's a lot deeper stories there. Yeah, there's a there's a classic map by uh, I think by Albert Gallatin. He did it through the American Antiquarian Society in the 1830s, um, and it's an attempt to show uh, the the uh, indigenous boundaries. I think by language in in North uh, in North America. Um, but I think one of the one of the distinctions that it makes is that it says, well, east of uh, east of the Mississippi, um, it was you know circa uh, 1600, and west of the Mississippi, it's circa, you know, it's circa uh, 1830. Oh my, um, <laughs> that's funny because we often, you know, when I teach the West, I have a series of maps, and I have the students vote like, where is the West? You know, is it west of the Mississippi, Missouri? Is it, you know, west of the Appalachian Mountains? And and someone finally says, well, when are you talking about? And that's yeah. kind of the point I'm always hoping they'll get to, you know. Um, so that's funny that after the Mississippi uh, is the dividing line, but only after 1860 <laughs> um, or 1830, whenever whenever that map was made. Um, this also makes me think of, um, and I uh, I should have sent this to you before to get your thoughts on it. Um, so here in Utah, we have what we call Sitla lands, which is an acronym. is It's the State of Utah School and Institutional Trust Lands Administration, mm-hmm. and they administer about three and a half million acres of trust lands. These come from, you know, at statehood in 1896, the Utah as a state is granted all kinds of different trust lands with uh, designated for very specific, some were designated for specific schools, for hospitals, different things. Um, but then in townships, you know, there were four sections in each township that were designated for public schools. But um, some of these lands have then been are, are checkerboarded. Some of them have been clumped together, and the state now administers them and generates revenue from energy and mineral leases, uh, renting them, uh, leasing them out for grazing, and so forth. And those funds are part of ongoing endowments then yeah. for uh, for the states um, for state schools, which is great for education in Utah. Um, I wouldn't expect that you've come across this specific example in Utah, but is this a broader phenomenon? So moving kind of stepping aside from the the Morrill Act uh, land grants, which were often, you know, sold off uh, very quickly. Um, is this representative of broader things in the West of state education receiving you know, kind of, I mean, because I would love to see uh, you or someone else take the Sitla land map of where all of these uh, state educational lands are, and then map those to, uh, uh, you know, as your other project is done. Yeah, I mean, it it absolutely is. I mean, the all of these sort of uh, different states have different names for them. Uh, they usually uh, revolve around something like the Common School Fund, mm-hmm. uh, and these lands all, uh, in some way tie back to the land ordinance of 1785, which first uh, introduces this idea of setting uh, setting apart a section of a township um, to be held for the purpose of raising a fund for a common school. Um, these change over time. Uh, in the arid west, uh, the idea is they need more land because the land is worth uh, each acre is worth less. Um, so Western states will have larger, uh, larger footprints of these sort of common, uh, uh, common school fund lands, uh, where it would be either two sections of a township, you know, a, a township has uh, 36 sections, it'll be two, uh, or, uh, I guess you, you said it was four in, in Utah. Yeah, it says, um, yeah, they're given four sections per township for public schools. Yeah, so this is four square miles. This is one ninth of every 
uh, of every township. Um, so the big difference uh, with the Morrill Act um, is uh, is not of kind. It's a, it's of it's of degree. I mean, it's literally much, much, much bigger. Uh, imagine, uh, you know, four acres out of out of every township. Um, I don't know how many townships are in each state. I think in Wisconsin, when I looked once, there were 1,300 townships, right? Um, so this adds up to a significantly uh, larger uh, amount of land, and these funds are are integral. Um, they're often described as the sort of the, the cornerstone yeah. of public education in in the West. I mean, they typically don't cover uh, the entirety of of the budget, um, but they provide the they provide the base that was grown on in the same way in the same way uh, that you have the the Morrill Act providing seed funding. Um, and the Morrill Act isn't even in this case the uh, it, it's not the it's not taking the lead, right? These these uh, common school lands existed. Before the Morrill Act, there were instances of uh, of federal grants for university land before the Morrill Act, after the Morrill Act, that's separate from the Morrill Act. Um, there are other types of land uh, that are that are doled out to states um, through their enabling acts. These are the acts that turn territories into into states, um, and they are called uh, you no, know, they they're typically called trust lands. Um, but one state, Idaho, um, describes them as their endowment lands. Hmm. Um, they are endowing the state uh, with resources to uh, to create the state. I'm reading here on this Utah site. It says since 1994, Sitla has generated 1.96 billion dollars in revenue. Yeah. So this is not a small amount of money 1. Point, almost 2 billion but that is over a, a 25 year period mm-hmm. in new mexico the the state lands last year generated a billion dollars in one year in one year um and i would think if you looked at a state uh today or over the past 10 years someplace like north dakota where there's been an oil boom You'd also see uh, uh, gains in the uh, in the amount uh, that they're able to raise uh, from these uh, from the state lands. This is not a new story. Um, most people know that s- state uh, education uh, and a lot of funds for for that, especially as there's ongoing debates about uh, you know raising taxes in order to help uh, fund public education and so forth. A lot of us know that some of the Funding for this comes from from trust lands, um, but then taking that a step farther back and then recognizing where those trust lands come from is a story that uh, I think you know remains to be told. I mean that's what's really exciting about digital history and exciting about the companion site that you did, and I'll link to that in the show notes um, so people can go play around with the the data visualizations. But being able to take um, Say you know all all of these land records, and uh, I commend you for I cannot imagine how many hours of poring over old land records you had to do. Um, I've done that only a little bit, and it was rough rough work. Um, but taking what is otherwise inaccessible data that the public will just doesn't have the um, the skill set or even know where to access these kinds of things, taking those and then presenting them in a digital format with a narrative, uh, and your site telling this narrative of how native land was transformed into uh, public education. Um, I hope that more projects will, will undertake this and keep uncovering uh, the, the native histories behind you know, any number of, of things in, in the United States right now. It really speaks to the power of digital, digital history, I think. I did have one last question, though, that I wanted to ask, kind of on, uh, that we kind of pass over a little bit. So, you said you've located uh, you and, t- and then published together here with High Country News more than 99% of all the Moral Act acres. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's some less than 1% out there still missing. What speaks? Uh, are there missing records? Is it just hard to track things down? Uh, what explains these yet to be identified lands? Yeah, I mean you're cutting to the sort of methodological heart of of the project i mean the the real challenge with understanding um the moral act footprint on the north american landscape is first of all that there is 
nothing that you can look up that will tell you exactly how many acres were actually distributed through the Morrill Act. There are sort of uh, rules of thumb. Uh, there are the amounts that was authorized, um, but they don't necessarily match on to the amount that was actually distributed um, really? through the Morrill Act or through subsequent in lieu acts. So we had to first um, construct a set of benchmarks, uh, the amount of land, you know, from various reports uh, at the at the state level and federal reports that distinguished um, the amount of land that was authorized from the amount that was actually granted. I mean, there's lots of little details in how this can can be changed. I mean, certain lands were deemed more valuable than others and counted more against the grant, for instance, uh, which would reduce the actual physical acres uh, that were distributed. Um, there are all sorts of things that could, could change the amount of, of land that was actually distributed. Um, so we had to create a set of benchmarks that would tell us how much land we were actually looking for in the first place. Um, most things that you'll, most places that report the amount of land that the Morrill Act distributed will say, uh, 11.4 million acres. This was the amount that was authorized. Uh, we believe that the amount actually distributed was closer to 10.8 million acres. Um, you'll also see the figure 17.4 million acres uh, quite a bit, which seems to have been a typo that has just been lifted into <laughs> a sort of statistical echo chamber and been repeated over and over. Um, but we believe it's 10.8 million acres, just to, just about there. Um, so we had to get external benchmarks for uh, each of the states and, that were separate from the records that we were consulting to sort of fill in the buckets, basically. Uh, with the amount of land, you know, adding, you know, one by one, uh, to, to see how close we were getting to those benchmarks. Wow. Um, and sometimes we were, sometimes we were under. Um, this could be for the, it, it can get really down into the nitty gritty. So for example, these pieces of script, um, that they would give out, you could, uh, get less than 160 acres with the script. Say there's a plot, it's 156 acres. Um, you can take that with the script. The four acres are lost. Um, you can also get 162 acres with it. You just have to pay a fee for the uh, for the extra two. You have to you have to pay separately uh, for them. But in the records, it's not going to be separated out, um, and it's still distributed under the authority of something like the Morrill Act. So you get all these sort of wrinkles in sort of the exactness of the figures. So we created the benchmarks, um, and then we tried to match them state by state um, as as best we could. Um, so there are certainly some records that are lost. There are some records that were illegible. Um, there are variations sort of over and under for some of the reasons that I was, what, that I was just explaining. Um, but we, uh, that sort of figure, that 99% figure comes from us getting less than 1% away from the benchmarks that we set uh, at the beginning of the project um, to locate the acres. So it's it's certainly possible that there are other acres um, out there to be found. And if you look in the data, um, you can see the sort of variations uh, across across the states. So if someone wanted to try and fi find some missing acres, you could you could take a look state by state and see what would be the uh, uh, the best uh, candidates to go to go looking. Um, but, yeah, I was trying to. Uh, trying to figure out, uh, trying to build a, a methodology from scratch to answer a question um, that uh, we didn't have a roadmap to, to answer based on the sort of previous literature. Well, it's astounding that you were able to do a near comprehensive job. That's, that's astounding. Um, so, I mean, it's not as much that, say, puzzle pieces are missing, if you know, to use a puzzle analogy. It's that uh, maybe there are a couple pieces missing, um, but the, the puzzle pieces were not cut uh, to fit exactly. There's little slivers here and there that just may be impossible to track down. Yeah, no, I mean it, w it, w it would be possible to to refine it uh, slightly on on a, on a state level. I'm sure. I, it, whenever you engage in a sort of large scale project like this, you have to accept uh, that. Um, errors are going to creep in or you're going to miss things that you would that you would like to find. Um, there was a there was one sort of story sort of late in the game. Um, we had thought uh, based on federal reports of the amount of land that New Mexico had received uh, 
Um, we had thought that it was, uh, you know, a hundred thousand acres less than they actually received. And it was only through the process of, uh, us, us researching the lands that remained, um, that we discovered our, our error. And sort of late in the game, uh, we had to That's send, a small uh, cable. <laughs> yeah, we, well, it was, I mean, it's about, uh, it would have, it would have turned it from, you know, 98% of the total to, to, it, it made the difference between 98 and 99% of the total. Um, 99 just really rolls off the tongue better though. Yeah, yeah, it does. <laughs> but we were able to get those acres uh at the sort of last minute by sending um Kalen, he lived near the the uh the BLM archive in New Mexico or or close enough where he could go there and have me FaceTiming with the archivist um to figure out the final list that we needed to transcribe. Um and we were able to get them sort of the last minute, maybe about six weeks before publication. Wow. Uh we were able to incorporate them into the data set, uh which had me, you know, biting my nails because I had one you know, I'd I had become so attached to it being, you know, uh less than a less than a percent uh off of what we expected the total to be. <laughs> wow. Well tell us a little bit about um where you're taking this project and moving it forward. You hinted that maybe there's some other digital things coming out, but I also wanted you to Tell us just very briefly how this is going to fit into um, to, to the book manuscript that you have in progress, which um, uh, I think your working title is Louisiana Purchases, the Indian Treaty Line and the Making of American History. And I'm curious if this where this fits into that. Yeah, this is uh, this is separate from my my book manuscript. This OK, is well, a, a, why don't you tell us then where what what you're going to do with this project then to move this forward. And then uh, at the end. Um, I like to always ask people what they're doing next, and maybe you can tell us a little bit about about the other project, the book project that you're working on too. Yeah, I mean, the reason why we uh, pursued this project as sort of a as a collaborative um, joint uh, academic journalism uh, endeavor was to um, was to get this material out publicly because I mean. It, we have done i uh, uh, we put a lot of work into this and we we pulled together a tremendous amount of material but i think once you get past the sort of the initial shock of you know okay this is about 11 million acres that we've located and you can go and you can visit them um you realize that there is a tremendous amount left to be done on this issue um we are at sort of the sort of the the tip of the the tip of the iceberg here um and there's no way um, that a, a a single researcher or uh, our team at HCN um, could comprehensively go through and tell the the, the full story of the implications of uh, the transfer of uh, wealth from indigenous nations to universities. Um, what you'll see here is very you know in our story, for instance, is is very little about how these funds were ultimately used, right? I mean, because to to research this at a comprehensive level, you would have to make a tour of uh, you know uh, many, state archives yeah. and university archives. Um, so the goal here um, in making uh, not just putting the story out and not just building the website, um, but making the full data set public uh, immediately for other researchers to delve into um, is to encourage other people to look into uh, to look into the history of the Morrill Act um, using what we've done as a uh, as a sort of springboard. Um, yeah. So you don't have to start from don't have to start from scratch. You can get a sense of uh, of a university's uh, footprint in the Morrill Act pretty quickly from the material that we've done and use that to orient um, to orient deeper dives uh, into state archives, university archives um, to really understand the implications of all this. So, I mean, one of the things that we're hoping um, comes out of this project um, is that it doesn't fall to us to to do all of the future work on this that there is uh encouragement of uh of teaching at universities uh around this issue that uses archives um that uses either university or state archives um that there are um uh investigators either history majors or student journalists at at universities who might want to might want to look into this deeper and use what we've done um as a as a starting point to take the to take the next step um so that's what we're we're hoping uh comes out of this that uh that um more people uh 
expand the the, the reach of uh, this uh, this collaborative work that we've done. Um, and well, I think we're very cool. interested in providing the tools uh, to be able to do that, either for people who are using the website or people who are interested in downloading the data to, to understand it. So one of the things that we did before this uh, story came out, although it was um, it was affected tremendously by the outbreak of the the coronavirus pandemic um, was we were doing trainings with uh, with journalists um, from other magazines and newspapers with the data um, so that they could go and look uh, deeper at, at the, the this history in their regions. Um, and we'd like to see more of that, um, both uh, in the sort of uh, in the halls of academia and also in the journalistic world um, that this project sort of fused together. Well, I think it's powerful. I, one, one thing that excited me so much about this, I'm, I've been a longtime reader of high country news and um, my own scholarship is kind of moving into environmental history. So high country news is my jam. And I've been watching their indigenous um, affairs. I don't know if you'd call it a desk, but um, it, it is an indigenous affairs desk. Do they, they name the, it that? Uh, okay. was the editor there until quite recently. Okay. And I've been seeing that kind of grow and been very excited. That, oh, I'm, that's, that's great. The HCN is kind of paying attention to indigenous um, things. But then when, when your project dropped, um, I was just astounded. I thought it was so great to see this multi, to see HCN really to lead by example, to show like that journalists and academic research, researchers can build not just productive partnerships, but you know, this was a multi-year project. I don't know how much money HCN sunk into this, but this probably cost a lot of money, but the end result is, is profound. There are, there's no shortage of amazing academic researchers that are doing things just like you're doing. And some of them even building some digital components or digital history websites or resources. But the public might not hear about it. The academy might get excited. A few of the researchers might get excited. But I applaud High Country News for, for showing you know, that journalists and journalistic institutions can work hand in hand with academic researchers and to, to produce something that the public can consume. But then as you say that then other, I mean, and hats off to you then that you were doing training with other journalists, other organizations, other magazines to pick up the baton and do the same thing. I think that's where I really hope that a lot of, a lot of researchers are going. I mean, here at the Red Center, a lot of what we do is, you know, public history and trying to push for public engagement. And this is just a premier example of, of doing that from your end and from HCN side. Yeah, I mean, historians typically, uh, when they work, um, when they sort of, uh, dip their toe into the world of journalism, it's, it's to do, uh, a couple of different things, either to distill research that they've, they've done. So they're writing an article that's, um, accessible to a broader public that, uh, reports on findings that they've already found. Um, or they're drawing on their, uh, expertise, um, in their, in their area. Uh, to illuminate contemporary events yeah. um, and things like editorials. And both those are, are vital functions. Um, but what we were trying to do here um, was not to uh, not to um, distill previous research or uh, or just offer commentary, um, but to offer direct a direct research project um, that uh, that draws on the the skill sets um that um, both historians and journalists and journalists have. Uh, and I think there's a lot of common ground between our fields. I mean, normally when we talk about doing interdisciplinary interdisciplinary work or multidisciplinary work, um, it's sort of within the halls uh, of academia. Yeah. I mean, when we look outside, I mean, we see, you know, uh, professions that are sort of facing uh, similar similar pressures, right? Um, uh very few jobs in journalism, very few jobs uh, for historians, um, dwindling pools of money to be able to do uh, long term uh, research projects. Yeah, you, you could be talking about print journalism or online journalism or education. Like, yeah, yeah. It, and what we found is that we could get a lot of uh, a lot of mileage out of pooling our, our, our resources and our and our skill sets. Um, and this was the this was the result of that. I mean, you note. Yeah, some of the other ways that some of us dabble in journalism. I wrote a 
a piece for for Public Radio International last year. But again, it was just a distillation of my previous research, and I was tying it to contemporary issues. Um, or you have uh, the Washington Post has that great Made by History series where mm-hmm. historians step in and and illuminate contemporary issues with their research. Um, and I wanted to use this perhaps as a segue to your book because uh, back in 2017 you wrote a great piece for Slate um, about uh, the Louisiana Purchase. Um, this is right about the time I think that you were finishing your dissertation as well, maybe within months of finishing your dissertation, um, mm-hmm. uh, where you did you did this. You took your research and distilled it down to a very easily consumable story for the general public. Um, but uh, it looks like this uh, is uh, what your book is going to be about. So maybe we can close things out. We've pro- we're probably uh, wearing the patience of our listeners thin here now. Yeah. Um, but um, why don't you tell us about your book project um, about the Louisiana Purchase and it, you know, it being tied to um, native lands and uh, when we can expect to see that. Yeah, the, um, the the Slate piece was a distillation of an article that I wrote for the Journal of American History, um, revising the uh, the sort of oft quoted um, inexpensive cost of the Louisiana Purchase. You know, the fifteen million dollars for such a uh, deal. Eight, eight, 800,000 uh, square miles um, to incorporate the costs of uh, extinguishing indigenous title through hundreds of treaties um, and tracking tracking that down using a mix of uh, forensic accounting, um, traditional archival research and uh, and uh, techniques in GIS or historical uh, GIS. Um, and the larger project that that's from uh, is trying to. And I should note also for listeners that that article won. Almost every award there is, I think. Uh, so con- congrats on that. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, no, that was very, uh, that was very exciting, uh, exciting for me, and makes me hopeful that there will be a uh, a readership for um, the book when it when it does come out. Yeah. But what the book is about is trying to reorient um, reorient the geography um, that we imagine when we think of the territorial expansion of the United States. When we think of the expansion of the United States, we have this sort of mental map um, anchored by the Louisiana Purchase. There's the Mexican Session, the Gadsden Purchase, um, so on and so forth. And it's a sort of chunking sprawl uh, through which the United States builds itself. Um, but if we if we shift our focus away from um, what is sort of like the Louisiana Purchase deemed relatively easy and cheap, and think about what was costly, uh, time-consuming, and difficult, Um, that brings our attention uh, to the expansion of the United States that was affected through the Indian Treaty System um, across the 19th century, but really from the the 1790s to the 1870s uh, most heavily. Um, And the sort of organization that's at the heart of my my book um, is something called the St. Louis Superintendency, which uh, is not very well known. It's an obscure sort of uh, regional um, administrative arm of uh, the Office of Indian Affairs. Um, but what it did, uh, what its whole purpose of being was uh, to manage the sets of relations that were constantly emerging and reshifting around the Indian Treaty Line, the sort of moving spine of, uh, of U.S. expansion in the 19th century. Um, and when you look at what this institution is doing over the course of about 60 years from, from 1800 to, to 1860, it sort of changes its name over time, uh, but it exists throughout this period. Um, what it's doing is having a hand in a in a number of very well known events that you would find in any sort of textbook, um, from the Lewis and Clark expedition uh, to bleeding Kansas. So what the book is doing um, is providing a biography of an obscure institution told through a series of uh, a series of very well known events um, that it had a hand in shaping. And the sum of those, the sum of those parts, what they what they add up to, um, is is a sense um, that the work of administering uh, or trying to manage the movement of the Indian Treaty Line in the 19th century was central, uh, central to the development of the state um, in ways uh, that have been hidden in plain sight. So much like this, uh, the project we talked about today, you're. You're you're kind of opening up things that have been obscured and showing us the more more complicated history there. That sounds that sounds great. Um, well, 
thank you so much uh, for taking some time to talk with us today, Dr. Robert Lee. Um, I really look forward to seeing um, your other things come out soon. I hope you weather the pandemic well in England, and I um, hope to see you soon at some conferences here in the United States sometime soon. Yeah, thank you, Brandon. Thanks, you, thanks so much for having me. All right, take care. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you'll subscribe and listen every month. Please leave a review on whatever app or platform you're using, or follow us on Facebook at Writing Westward Podcast or on Twitter at Writing West, where you can get updates and leave comments. Writing Westward is a production of the Charles Wright Center for Western Studies at Brigham Young University. Our theme music was provided by local Utah composer Micah Dahl Anderson. Find him at Micah, D-A-H-L, Anderson with an O, dot com. I'll go ahead and put that link in the episode description if you didn't catch it. My name is Brendan Rensink. I serve as the podcast host, producer, sound engineer, publicist, and just about everything else. So you can direct any praise or critiques my way. I'm associate director of the Red Center and an associate professor of history at Brigham Young University. I'm author and editor of a number of books on the West, borderlands, native peoples, genocide studies, religion, and the environment. You can find out more on my website, bwrensink.org, or follow me on Twitter at Brendan W. Rensink. That's B-R-E-N-D-E-N-W-R-E-N-S-I-N-K. One last plug, if you live in the Intermountain West, check out the Red Center's digital public history project, Intermountain Histories, by visiting intermountainhistories.org, or by downloading the free mobile app by searching for Intermountain Histories on your Apple or Android devices. With this website and mobile app, you can read carefully curated about complete with archival photos, bibliographies, and more. Well, until next month, be well, be curious, be kind.